Hello everyone. I'm David. This is Shelby. Hello. We're here on the Hammered Lampstand, a Christian podcast to bring Christ to your life. And today we're talking about Genesis chapter 2, as well as answering another question we received. Super relevant to Genesis 2, by the way, uh, so I'm thankful for that. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about Katie's question first, and then we'll go and maybe do a little quick recap of what happened in Genesis 1, and then we'll just dive right into the text and do verse Read in verse, Genesis 2. Talk about it, see what's going on there, see what we can learn, and um, yeah, hope that God guides our voices and uh, our equipment and stuff. Amen. So hey! So be it. Welcome back! Welcome back, guys. Very exciting. Uh, so I'm thankful that we got another question from someone named Katie on Facebook. Uh, and she had watched our Genesis 1 video, and she noticed something that I did not notice. Oh, tell she me. She said uh, that uh, wh- one thing, well, I'll just read her quote so I don't put words in her mouth, but then I'll take, I'll explain my interpretation of it a little bit. So one thing you say in the video, a lot of people say you have a choice to believe in God or not, but I'm not sure that's true. People can't help what they believe. My husband is atheist, and he tries to understand my faith, but he simply can't. I have also deconstructed my beliefs, and I learned I cannot help but believe in God. So I think it's a choice. I think it's based on many things throughout our lives. Super interesting question. Okay. Yeah, the, so the reason I said that she pointed out something I didn't even notice, because I had to go back to the video and see what she was even talking about. Because I remember that a couple videos before, before we even started our Genesis uh, series, I had probably said something kind of to the opposite effect. Like, oh yeah, some people literally cannot believe in God. And uh, I think there's some verses to back that up, but ultimately in the grand scheme of the Bible, it uh, it's more paradoxical and more glorious and more reflective of an amazing character of God than that. So I have to say that I was wrong and you were right. Thank you. Yeah. Because you were good. the one that said it. You were like, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you were the one that said in the first uh, video that, you know, you have a choice whether you believe in God or not. And I think that's so important because... Uh, what did you teach me? It's like Calvinism. Otherwise, to... Right. So talking about between free will and predestination, you know, there's uh, Calvinists, which I disagree, is they believe that, you know, God had decided before he made all of us that a certain amount of us are going to be saved, a certain amount amount of us are not going to be saved. The ones who are chosen, great, we're, we're lucky for whatever reason he chose us. We don't know why, but somehow... We're yeah. a little bit better because he did choose us, Yikes. which I don't agree with at all. Doesn't I agree. sound very just. I agree, although I believe God knows everything, everything that has and will ever happen to the to the finest detail of it, because he's the creator of all of it. I think he's still very obviously given us free will and the yeah. choice to follow him or the choice to follow Satan, the choice to eat from the tree, the choice to follow our flesh, or the choice to follow Christ. Yeah. And I think these are really important topics that we can talk about. Exactly. I think that like really gets to the heart of the matter. Like, how do you reconcile the idea that God is sovereign above all things and ultimately like he has the final call, but at the same time, humanity has free will. Like we're not just puppets. Absolutely. And we're put here as as you said, I got a little upset because you said little G gods. I'm like, ah, I don't really like even referring to us even close as little G gods. I prefer what the Bible says, which is which is vice regents. Yes. So we're here, you know, in under the order of God to follow God's orders and you know, he leads by example, of course, but to continue the same will as him and be his vice regents to take care of the earth yeah well i should have you're right i should have clarified a little more what i was referring to like there's a lot of church fathers especially from the orthodox tradition that say like uh god became man so that man could become like gods and this kind of all feeds into the whole image bearer thing Mm -hmm. um but it's it's referred to as theosis in orthodoxy if anybody wants to do more research into that really interesting but it definitely doesn't give us the right to feel like uh, we, that we are God because yeah. the the scary thing is you know I understand that teaching completely but for people who might not they believe that by believing in Jesus they are becoming Jesus whether yeah. that's Christ consciousness or what but we have to know that we are nothing without Jesus we are not Jesus we are not the Messiah we are saved by the Messiah we are saved by Jesus thank God and we lead by you know we follow his example we're made in the image of him which we're going to talk about yeah um, but I don't want us to ever think that because we follow Jesus we become Jesus that's a yeah. very scary yeah. scary next step it's scary because you fall into the pride thing that made absolutely satan fall in the first place and mm-hmm. the fall that we're going to see probably next episode because you know not going to touch on the fall in genesis 2 just kind of lay the groundwork for it and then we'll go into the whole problem evil and everything next time but we had a, we have enough let's here enjoy our about. two good chapters to start yes so one of the reasons that i think predestination is not uh like it, it doesn't jive with my thinking of the Bible and how it uh, is related to us because free will is a necessary factor in love. It, you know, Right. Otherwise, we're all God's slaves and yeah. all God's servants. Yeah. I don't have to love you. No. <laughs> yeah. 
it's a, it's a choice to love God, and God set it up that way because you know you know to make us just automatons would be boring, right? <laughs> like yeah. and and meaningless essentially. Like we crave a, a real personal relationship, and we're made in the image of God, which is the same th- same thing He craves. We have the same feelings as God does. Yeah, sure. So I dived into the Bible to find some examples of where this happens. And um, two things that I wanted to kind of juxtapose against each other okay. were Job and Pharaoh. Oh, okay, so two good ones. Job, um, I know we, you know, it's kind we're of, not there yet. We're, we're gonna not there, there yet. We'll get there eventually. But a lot of people have kind of like a general framework of a lot of the popular Bible stories anyway. Right. Um, so just a quick recap. We'll go into it in depth in the future. But Job is this dude who's righteous before God, like... Uh, not doing anything wrong, always praying to God, even for the on his children's behalf, like just like making sacrifices and yeah. just in case they may have sinned. Yeah, yeah. And which is like, beautiful. Just trying to be a good guy, trying to uh, show his love for God. And um, the adversary comes and he's like, well. And no. also, don't forget, uh, he was also very blessed because of yes, this. You yes. know, he had quite, he had quite a very family, wealthy. a lot of possessions, a lot of animals. And so we could see Satan obviously having some jealousy in this. And, yeah. And saying, you know, God, if you didn't bless Job like you have, he wouldn't follow you. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's the point. He's real sassy about that. And that's like kind of a, a pattern that's <laughs> that the adversary uses, right? So he's trying to, uh, you know, stir things up. And God allows him the ability to do this in Job's life. Like he, Job goes through absolute, like. Misery. Yeah, total. Uh, hell on earth. Yeah, truly. basically. Yeah, so like even his, his family members die. He gets like horrible, like illness in his body, like everything. Even his own wife tells him like, just curse God and die. You know, like it's yeah, pretty heavy a, stuff. Yes. But he maintains his faith and he doesn't do that. He still like uh, maintains his loyalty to God through everything regardless. Right. And, you know, it, it, we're playing with his free will choices. Yeah. That's and, what the adversary is doing. And I don't want to get too deep because I know we're in Genesis. I don't want to skip over to Job. But also, you know, his three friends that came all mm-hmm. basically trying to uh, say in a different way, it's probably your fault. You probably sinned. This probably came on yeah. you by something you did. And Job was, I didn't do anything, you know, like I haven't done anything like extraordinary, like are sinful or, you know, and they kept trying to push that. And I, the story is beautiful because it teaches teaches us that there's going to be bad things that happen in life. Satan is the ruler of this world right now, okay? We live in a very sinful, fallen yeah. world. So naturally, there's going to be bad things that happen, especially when we follow Jesus. We're going to be, we're told we're going to be persecuted even more. Yeah. So we can't say that every bad thing happen is a consequence of my sin or my parents' sin. There's just things that are going to happen bad on the earth because we have Satan running it right now. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, but at the end of that story, uh, essentially, Job passes the test, if you will. Um, you know, he still... Continues to follow God. Exactly, and he is granted greater blessings than what he even started he ends up with you know i don't know 10 to 30 fold more than he already had like his riches were so so uh, multiplied yeah yeah and so the opposite of that story is pharaoh pharaoh which in uh egypt. It, yeah in egypt you know let my people go during that's, the time of moses that's moses's time uh the israelites are all stuck under pharaoh in slavery and he's just like really really awful like he just like oh like you guys have to make bricks out of straw now because i feel like it like yeah. he's just really just mean to he them was angry he tried to say that they were lazy and they needed to work harder and the only reason that they have the strength to complain is because we're not working them hard enough oh I, yikes. yeah yeah he was pretty uh uh, yikes but so god sends moses to pharaoh to try and convince him like the quote uh, at one point is like how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me and let my people go so that they may worship me like he just he keeps giving pharaoh the choice and it's it says in the the first couple chapters or verses that pharaoh hardened his own heart he was like no 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 and then at the end it shifts a little bit and we start seeing the language that god hardened pharaoh's heart right every time we saw um pharaoh go through some sort of punishment you could see him suffering from that punishment and nearing the corner of saying oh do i just let them go do i just follow god and then at the last second always hardening his own heart and then you know i get he probably felt in a way he was able to manipulate Moses because he was able to stop so many plagues with kind of just a, a pushing a, a pushing a lie saying no I'll let you go just in a little bit I'll let you go in a little bit I'll let you go in a little bit which never happened which is why all these plagues had to happen including up to the first loss of his firstborn son yeah well they're similar in a way to the plagues on Job's personal life right um I mean it's it's really fascinating but I, I think 
the reason it's so fascinating to me is because it seems like you can lose your free will. Like, you know, if you were just stubborn your entire, like, like forever, 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 you actually, you do harden your own heart. There are people whose hearts have been so hardened by so many things that there is no looking back. They don't, they don't feel there is any other pathways or options. And that's a, that's a really scary place to get to in life. And I think that's like the way that we can reconcile God's sovereignty and free will. Like he gives us many, many chances and it's, it's in time, you know, like a, God is timeless, yeah. but he puts us on a timeline to allow us to grow. And I think I, I should have written it down, but there's a great C.S. Lewis quote here where he says, the only complete human is one who is, you know, the freedom that comes in to being a complete human comes from mastering your own desires, like sub subjugating your desires to your will. Uh, having your spirit control your flesh. Yeah. Yeah. So fascinating. I think that's pretty clear that God's doing that stuff in our life. And I think that the reason I mean yeah, like I said before there is verses that suggest that um you know some people literally can't believe and I also think that we need to just be aware that it's God's timing and not like force people or anything again uh but we'll we'll see what happens right and I know you know trust me I would be absolutely devastated if you said you know I'm no longer a believer or something like that okay and I could see how that would totally pull my faith in so many different directions because like you know it, it it destroyed, you know, I lost part of my flesh, we become one flesh. And if you stop believing, then that, that destroys part of what we had. And so um, I can, I can really see with her question, like the pain behind the question and the yeah. understanding of that. And we just have to remember that God works in his own time in miraculous ways. Like, you know, you don't hear about it a lot, but uh, we were just seeing so many examples of Muslims being saved most of the time by dreams they have of seeing Jesus and that there are more Muslims in Muslim countries uh, converting to Christianity than we have United States citizens converting to Christianity, right. you know, as well as people like Gary Habermas, this amazing book right here on the resurrection of Christ, which I tell everyone should read this book. Yeah, he's a Buddhist, uh, right? Yeah, he was, he started as, he went to biblical school learning all of this, being growing up in like you know a christian household and then saying you know am i an atheist am i agnostic for 10 20 years and then 10 years another 10 years saying you know maybe i identify as a buddhist and then he came to find jesus through the evidence of the resurrection which is really really amazing so people they don't get stuck on one path people can change yeah. their minds and you know i do totally believe we have free will to follow or to not to follow god and i think you know if i met somebody that really truly was having a hard time of grasping if Jesus Christ could be the Messiah. First, I would want to know truly if it was, uh, they felt it was a lack of evidence or if they felt that it was something more uh, of emotional um, damage that they have to, because there's emotional doubt. Somebody and then, in the church and then there's factual doubt. They didn't like. yeah. And I would love to share with them all the, you know, the, the evidence and history and all the factual arguments, which I've done with some people. And when some people still say, you, you know, still, I don't believe, then you have to get into the area and working on an emotional doubt side because that's a whole different part of the equation than not just believing the evidence but to having emotional doubt. So there are different parts of us that we need to work on to bring to bring us closer to God. That's so true. Uh, I feel like uh, you made me think of Paul too. Like that's one of the biggest biblical examples of somebody who had a like major transformation. Amen. Not an uneducated guy. Right. Very, very intelligent. One of the best examples we have in history, you know, claiming to, yeah. to the Messiah of Christ. Hated Christians at first, persecuted them to death, and yes. then had a conversion experience that you can see and it's so a gift it's always a gift it's so funny because any any of the um you know uh, uh biblical scholars even the atheist ones really do believe paul and all of paul's writings and say yes you can use most of his writings or whether it's seven or eight out of the 13 that books that he writes they agree with and say are historical and say are fact and take it as truth because you wouldn't see this huge transformation in somebody like you yeah. know he really went from one side of the coin to the other which is an amazing thing to see it's an, a miracle you know it's beautiful but so today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Absolutely. And nice. he's going to show you so many doors and so many times you're going to say, you know, you're going to get an invite to church. And you're going to say, ah, I don't really want to go this Sunday. I'm not really feeling it. But God is giving Been you there. all these different doors, all these different pathways and showing you. And you just got to open your eyes to them. You just really have to pay attention because they're there always. Yeah. Yeah. Opening your eyes is like a big part of it. It's like turning from a puppet to a real boy. Pinocchio. Right. <laughs> you know, if you grow up with the belief of that there is no God, that I am nothing, that I just evolved from cells and monkeys and I'm completely worthless, yeah. you have a, a way that you're going to look at the world. And if you grow up saying that I was created in the image of God, you have a completely different outlook on the world. So you we can look at the two same things, two things that we would call evidence and people would observe them and say completely opposite things about them because yeah. of, you know, the 
the blinder over our eyes there or the are, lack thereof. Right. There's very popular intellectuals right now who are running around with the idea that like we uh, we don't have any free will. We're basically like morality itself is a social construct and everything that like we do and say and think is all a product of a combination of chemistry and and your upbringing and everything like that. But it's it doesn't it doesn't jive well. Yeah, but ultimately with the story. it says it says we're worthless, which is why we and don't this need story to better. That. Way like better, lot. and this is the truth. Thank <laughs> God. So what? Yeah, why do people choose to just not, not even entertain like, this? It's stuff? scary. It's You're scary. right. They're emotional. Stop being emotional. Well, that's what we're here for—to yeah. yeah. tell them about Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I'm not here to call you emotional. That's that's not nice. Anyway, let's get into the summary of Genesis one, so we can boom go into Genesis two. Okay, can't wait. Uh, basically, what happened in Genesis one? God, this guy that well, you know, the. This God, <laughs> the one and only God that existed before the beginning of time, all powerful, all knowing, all loving. Uh, he is outside a, of space, time, and matter. Yes. outside of all these things. Yes, uh, not he, limited to anything. Right, and endless. Didn't have a beginning. Doesn't have an end, like it, we do. Absolutely, is a creator who spoke all existence that we know of into being mm-hmm. through his word, and um, he, you know, created a lot of things in harmonious pairs, like light and darkness, land and sea, birds and fish, male and female. He did all that in Genesis one, and that was it was the very creation good. Days. He said, "This is all very good," and he was very happy with Amen. it. Amen. And then uh, humanity is, of course, the crown jewel of it all. Right. Uh, he gives a dominion mandate to them, like you are to do something. Like you have a purpose. Your purpose is to image me. You're supposed to represent Vice me regents. on this earth. Right. And so like you, you take control of everything and you make it better. Um, so an interesting question that we really didn't delve into too much last time is what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Yes. That's a great question. I think you, did you uh, write down the definition that you got from that book or? So yes. So um, what the ultimate definition from that book was the image of God was the m- mental and spiritual capacity to serve and relate to God. Yeah, that's interesting. That's not bad. So uh, the reason I brought it up is because I was reading Michael Heiser's book, uh, The Unseen Realm, okay. and he kind of pushed back on the idea that it has anything to do with qualities. You know, like a, usually you see a, like a, a list of qualities like rationality and ability to communicate with God, like blah, 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 all and these I'd things. And I'd push back on that. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, no, no, just hear him out because okay. uh, he his argument was that that would imply that a baby in the womb who hasn't been born yet, who doesn't have the ability to make like rational thoughts and communicate with others, like that still is the image of God. And therefore, uh, the a better definition would be that it is a status. So the way that God views us is like, uh, you know, even uh, there's a lot of verses that say that even I knit you in your mother's womb and I had plans before plans for you before the beginning of time, like all these things like so God is granting you a status rather than a set of abilities because then you kind so of- I can see this. I can see this very well until we have Jesus Christ, God incarnate. Who was in and his mother's then, womb for a hot minute there. And then when you say the image of God, it has a whole new meaning because God has come in human form just like us, truly man, truly God. So I would like to argue that either this body or our new spiritual body is absolutely going to resemble Jesus uh, Christ oh yeah, in the millennium reign and in, in all the future. So I would like to say that it is not only spiritual, but also physical in a sense. Right. God is allowing us to work towards that. And we need to be, yeah, yeah. So you're, you're just kind of like making sure that we're still humble in that respect, which I understand totally. Um, comment if you have any uh, feedback on that. Because absolutely deep question. Ask any questions. Go on for argue. While. Tell me I'm wrong. Yeah, tell me I'm wrong. I'm We're ready. Wrong. We're ready. So, thus, the heavens and the earth were created. You want to read the first uh, part of Genesis Chap- 2? Genesis chapter 2. I would love to. <laughs> the seventh day, God rests. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Yeah. Yeah, you know what's kind of interesting about um, the seven-day cycle? Like, we're all so familiar with that in today, today and age, you know? like Yeah, yeah, that's the, we go by the seven-day week, the whole world does. But it doesn't make any sense. Like, uh, we, Unless you see where it came from. Right, yeah, yeah. So the, all the other things, like the length of a year, the length of a day, like these other ways of measuring the sky to tell time. Even the solar, the solar time, you know, the solar day. Yeah, but the seven-day week is pretty arbitrary. And a lot of other societies have gotten... Uh, 
far along just picking other numbers for their weeks. Like I think in China is like 10 days mm-hmm. was at one point. And, you know, the argument I think that almost made sense was that the lunar cycle, if you chop it into four, then you get sevens. But um, you could, uh, it doesn't exactly work out because sometimes it would be six, sometimes it would be eight or nine. Um, so what I'm thinking is that this is more, this is a social construct between God and man. Because uh, it doesn't, it doesn't reflect nature necessarily. I just, I just hate that phrase. I know. It's, but but, but it's continue. Dirty, isn't it? It it's, bothers me. It's been, yeah, it's been through Ugh. a lot. <laughs> Shake it off. But anyway, uh, so if you search about that, the first thing you probably find on Google is that the Babylonians invented the seven day uh, week. And that was long before the Jews. <sighs> and they always say like, oh, that was way before the Bible. That proves that the Bible didn't come up with it. But I don't think that's the same thing. Like you... The Bible talks about the origin of humanity way before the Jews for a while. And we Babylon's. don't have Jews yet. Yeah. Uh, we, and there's a lot of um, historians from that time, like Josephus is one of them, uh, who says that basically Adam and Seth and Enoch, they were spreading this. They were very knowledgeable about how to read the stars and stuff, and they were spreading this information around. And, uh, you know, the Babylonian seven-day week is quite opposed to the Jewish one, actually, because their seventh day is not for them to rest. It's for their God to rest. And they have to like do Extra like, things to appease day. the yeah. gods on that day. And versus where uh, you get the Israelites eventually in Exodus, we're not there yet again, but God's going to say like, this will be a sign between me and my people forever. And like, he wants us to rest right. and reset. So and that's beautiful. Two separate things I want to say about just uh, verses one and two, which is all mm-hmm. we've read so far. God resting. Okay. Does God need to rest? No. No. Did God stop working when he rested? No. If God stopped working, the universe would not be as it is today. Mm-hmm. God holds everything together. Um, always. Every day. So um, I just want to make it very clear that, you know, it, God shows so many, so many areas I could, I could quote throughout the Bible where the, the rest day is truly for us because if, you know, you meet people, I used to do it working 83 hours a week where you get burnt out so fast and you're just a zombie you're dead you don't want to do anything you have no life left to you You have nothing left to give and so we need as humans to have a day off god doesn't need that we need that absolutely and the other thing um that i wanted to talk about was oh okay and then um for the seventh day specifically i know how people like to argue oh do we worship on saturday do we worship on sunday you know do we follow the uh, Shabbat, the sabbatical day of rest. We follow, you know, what what early Christians were doing in the first century. You know, worshiping on Sunday. Um, and I want to say, we take a day of rest. We worship God on any and every day we would like. We should absolutely pick a specific day or time or time every single day to worship God. And that really, the whole idea is to step back from reality. And to look at God and to thank God for everything for that. So I don't want to fight whether it's Saturday or Sunday or anything like that. I think we should absolutely have a day that we go to church and worship God like we do. But I think you should be worshiping God and dedicating every time day. to him every single day. All the time. Right. Yeah, totally. Uh, definitely. So I think one of the quotes you were probably thinking of was in Isaiah. It says he does not grow weary or faint. That's God. Right. But then, of course, Jesus does when he's in the human flesh. And that shows the distinction between man and God, um, of course. Uh, but And the early Christians decided to change the Sabbath, I believe, because uh, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb, and that's that's when they discovered that... Right, the day Jesus rose. Yes. It's a Sunday. So they were differentiating themselves from the Jews who did not believe in Jesus. Right. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. It's fine. Worship God all the time. Why not? It's awesome. (laughs) What's the next verse? (laughs) Okay. So we read chapter 2, 1 through 3, and now we're going to read verses 4 through 10. So the creation of man and women... These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up 
every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Oh my. Wow. Okay, yeah, there's a lot going on there. A lot. So wait, let me let me scroll back to verse five. Scroll it back. About now, now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up for the okay. Lord had not said rain. Um, so sometimes people say this is a contradiction to Genesis 1 because he created all the plants. Uh, but I think the uh, Hebrew word about the shrub is something that is going to refer to like thorny things and then there's also seed there's also different kinds of vegetation like cultivated grains is another one so uh, what i read and that makes perfect sense to me about this not being a contradiction is that we hadn't made man had not made the tradition the transition from gatherer to farmer yet so there's no cultivated grains like wheat because cultivation involves choosing and uh, selectively breeding things, and, and like we hadn't done that yet, and the shrubs hadn't appeared because you know thorns came after the curse. You know, like the everything was cute and like nice and pretty flowers, probably. I'm so happy you said that and expanded on that because we have to remember that the words we're reading, it's so important to do word studies because the Bible was translated from Hebrew and Greek in the Old and the New Testament to English, and it is impossible to ever have perfectly, you know, word for word, which is why we have so many types of Bibles, yeah. why we have word for word, you know, phrase for phrase, meaning for compare, meaning. Compare, compare, compare. Yes, different comparisons. Um, just because, as many people who work with languages know, things don't translate over perfectly. You know, we have to make exceptions and to the rule. And one thing that I even love, you know, that leads us into perfectly is God making Adam from the dust of the ground mm -hmm. and breathing life into the nostrils, giving him life, the spirit of God. Uh, I really love the play on Hebrew, which you don't see as much in English because Ad Adam, Adama, really means dusty, earth, ground. Yeah. So God created dusty from the dust. He created Adam from the ground, which is a beautiful play on the words. You even see in some Bibles, not a lot, but uh, very, very far, like meaning for meaning ones, not word for word. Uh, sometimes they refer to the word hummus just to make like how beautiful like this creation and how like, you know, specific, you like, know, geez. Adam is dust from the ground with the breath of life of God. His name is Dusty. And it's yeah. really just, uh, it's a beautiful thing we see in the Hebrew that, you know, I wish people would learn to read Hebrew to read it in that sense because like the the poetry in it is just so much more eye-opening and so much more, you just, you, you learn so much more from it. Absolutely. And yeah, like the whole breathing into his nostrils, the breath of life thing, like that's the only creature that he's created thus far that, uh, at least that we know of, that gets that very intimate move where he breathes his spirit literally into him. And one thing that's super important, we see the word uh, bara, okay? And what we need to understand is that Adam was not formed from singular cells evolving, okay? That the word in Hebrew means he was made from nothing, from nothing. God took the dust and created and put his breath of life. God, yeah, God created, created him from his own hands. Anyway. Right. That there, there was no evolutionary process in it. I, you know, I hate to be, yeah. just throw that out there again from last episode, but... Yeah, but you know, that was still, a fun episode, wasn't it? Still affects my heart. <laughs> of course. Yeah, all right. So, um, you know, no vegetation, no cultivated plants, no thorns, no thistles is sort of like uh, saying that there were all kinds of metals, but there was no weapons yet. I think it just foreshadows human choice being a possibility in this place. Um, and... Another, uh, you know, not to go too far, but in the New Testament, we see a beautiful uh, relationship with this text where the breath of life uh, uh, um, is blown into the nostrils of the apostles to give them the Holy Spirit, yeah, which cool. is beautiful. Yeah, I know a lot of these things uh, go back and forth. They're so, so symbolic, yeah. Harmoniously. They use the poetry. Just like light and dark, the way that God does things, you know it. Um, so yeah, of course, we mentioned the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, I think, right? Right, yep. uh, But we are going to talk about that more when we get to the command, so I'm not even going to like play around with it too much yet, because obviously it's going to have a lot more context. Good thing you said that, because I was going to just throw a little bit out there, but I'm glad you stopped. We'll oh, hold on. No, no, no. Let's throw hold on to it and keep going. Okay. <laughs> okay? Should I read verse 10? Sure. Okay. So, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedelium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Jihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. So we see the four rivers. We still have two of them today. Two, you know, we still have the Euphrates and the Tigris. We don't know about the Pishon and the Gihon. Um, but yeah. yeah. 
this I feel like feels like kind of random to people sometimes, but I think it's exciting. Yeah, it's like it's a show that this was real. This was a real place, and for the people who lived within a certain amount of time of this, they could have said, "Oh, I know exactly where that is. That's you know by my grandmother's house." You know <laughs> sure. what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, it shows it. You get a lot of details revealed in the structure. Like if there's rivers flowing outward. Uh, it's probably down. So it's probably, it later says that the garden of God was on a mountain in Ezekiel. But I think that's already kind of implied by the rivers flowing out of it. And it's flowing into all different directions where adventure awaits. There's all kinds of cool stuff. It's not just like this garden that God created. There's all this other land that you can conquer and do whatever you want with. You can go get some gold and you can just build like a cool gold thing if you want to. Well, also probably looking, not a calf though. Looking into word studies, we see that the garden was an orchard. And that um, the Garden of Eden is a is actually a play on the word pleasure, like a garden of pleasure, you know, yeah, which is really beautiful. really beautiful yeah. in the first place. I love that. And um, the river in imagery is going to become important as well because uh, you know things that flow down the river, like everything that the river touches, is either blessed by what comes from the the top of the stream or. It could be cursed by what comes from the top of the stream. Yeah. And I think that's going to be an important reason that uh, Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. Um, but yeah, th the reversal of sin flowing out would be blessings flowing out. And that's what's going to happen in like the final uh, days because you'll still see rivers. Well-watered places are very common imagery for like God dwelling there. Right. Yeah. I love it. The God, you know, Christ always says he is the living water. You know, whoever drinks from him will not be thirsty again. Yes. Just, you know. Beautiful water has such a spiritual meaning to it. Absolutely. Awesome. I like it. Okay. So, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Uh, that's a good one we'll talk about. Yeah. Steve? That's, that's a lot going on there. Um... So, this is the first mention of evil at all. Right. That's interesting. Um, it, the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. The to have the knowledge for it. And what I often think about is like, why didn't they just say like, hey God, can you explain that a little yeah, bit? Can you elaborate? So, so <laughs> God, you said we we're going to surely die. Not sure, does that mean like immediately, like physically? Does that mean spiritually? Does that mean I'm getting pushed away? Does that mean we're going to get thrown out of the garden? Because they didn't know it then. I mean, we. I wish that we saw more communication about this. Yeah. But it's not just like, you know, uh, I see some people give the example like, oh, how a mother tells their child, don't touch the hot stove. It's nothing like that. That's like a simple, honest mistake that, you know, a child makes. With this, the seriousness of this is the equivalent of them saying, I am going to take the crown from God, who is the Lord, and take his lord and kingship and apply it to myself. I am going to take on this righteousness yeah. and decide for myself, which we may have heard from a snake as well. So <laughs> we didn't get there yet. I know we didn't get there yet, <laughs> but I just want to point it out that it is it is super serious. I mean, yeah. this is this is why evil falls. This is why the the fall of the earth has happened. This is why the earth is cursed, and it is because humans we have decided to be our own gods in a sense where we take the headship and the crown of Jesus Christ and God the Father and put it on us. Yeah. It says, you know what? I'm going to take this position. I'm not going to be God's vice, vice regent. I am going to be God. And that's what a serious of, uh, I don't want to say a mistake, but that's what a serious of a fall this was. Yeah. Well, that's why uh, the free will question was important to this context. And even like the theosis idea, uh, because it really is, the problem is in the disobedience. Absolutely. Like you get one rule and you know, that's it. Yeah. You could do whatever you want. You could go, go like follow the rivers, go eat all the fruits. And who knows what it really means to eat the knowledge of good and evil. Like right. you, it doesn't say you can't ask God about the tree. And you, cause you know, it says over and over again in the Bible, like if you ask God something like he's, he, he, He'll answer you. he's willing and faithful to answer yes. you. Um, so and it doesn't say you can't look at it. I know we'll touch on that a little bit next chapter too, but there's a lot of things that make me think that the actual, because the fruit itself is imbued with such a spiritual meaning, like the actual taking it into your body mm -hmm. um, would probably produce some sort of thing. Like, you know, now we have the experience of evil, literally because we disobeyed God and you feel the effects of it in your body in your bloodstream now. Yeah. And so when we see in the, you know, the last part of the last verse, um, for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. 
we should probably expand on that, you know, because some people are like, oh, well, why didn't they just drop dead after they ate the apple? Why didn't they just die immediately? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say it's spiritual because I don't like to throw away the physical aspect, but it's totally both. One, their relationship with God is completely fractured. They have taken the crown off of his head and put it on their own. And that Two, essentially is the tree of life itself. The tree of life, which is in the garden, which gives them their immortality like God, which God doesn't need, which God had granted to them because of this was taken away. So they will surely die because there is nothing. Only God is going to keep them going, whether it was through the tree or through him. So take both those yeah. away. And God says, you're not going to be infinite. You know, you're not going to be forever with me. I can't take the evil of man for, for thousands of years. This is why you're surely going to die, which obviously Adam and Eve surely did die. Yeah. Um, and I want to say that, that even though God knew that Adam and Eve were going to fall and the story of that was going to happen, I truly believe that Adam and Eve had wholeheartedly the choice whether she wanted to listen to say the serpent or not and say to the serpent you know my husband told me that we shouldn't eat this or we shouldn't even touch it so i'm gonna go back over to him you know he could have been standing right there of course but you know it could have played out very differently which is why we see god send jesus the second adam to complete the mission and not only to complete it but to succeed at it wholeheartedly and fully and not eat from the tree Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We're definitely going to get way more into that um, very, very soon because that's uh, all over Genesis 3 especially, but absolutely. I'm going to read just a tiny little commentary they throw uh, in the Bible, which is not, you know, this is not biblical text. This is just the commentary that's a part of it, but I just figured it's worth reading because it comes right after what we finished, verse 17. That's what we're doing here. And it says, The tree of knowledge of good and evil seems to come from nowhere, but it plays an important role. For one thing, it simply reminds the man that any authority he holds over the world, his dominion, his kingship, is not ultimate. There are limits to his authority, which reminds him that there is a high king who reigns above even him. That is why the consequence for eating from that tree is so severe. To do so is not simply a little mistake or a violation of some arbitrary, insignificant rule. It is to break the limits the high king himself has set, throwing off his authority and renouncing his rule, declaring independence from him and, be and beginning a rebellion against his crown. Yeah. Wow, a uh, much more beautiful <laughs> thing of what I tried to say. No, 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 you did good. Thank you. Awesome, yeah. I, absolutely. We're going to go so much more into that that I feel like we could probably go on to the next verse. Okay. So we're going to read 18 to, through 20. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper, fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Yeah. So this is beautiful. This takes place on the sixth day. Um, God has, you know, created the animals in Adam. And it's really beautiful because this is why some people also try and argue that, that the, the days are not 24-hour time periods. And one of the arguments against that is that so much happens on the sixth day, sixth day, which obviously it's not impossible for God to accomplish any amount that he wants, but it is impossible for us to accomplish a certain amount. And so what they try and throw in there and suggest, which I don't agree with, I'm just pointing out what they say, is that on day six, we see... Um, you know, the creation of Adam, we have the creation of animals. There is enough time for Adam to spend a, a, a moment in time, whether it's a minute or 10 seconds with every single animal. And yeah. I'm sure there was still a lot of them um, to go through, to give them a name, to have some sort of either personal connection or no connection with them. Um, and then enough time to say, I feel lonely, even after meeting these thousands or however many animals he did, and still enough time in the same day for God to then put him to sleep and do a surgery on him to make Eve. So that's what some people say, you know, there's not enough time in day six, but I think it works out perfectly. Yeah, I mean, God could do anything. Yeah. Um, totally, yeah. So it's not good for a man to be alone. That's not the same thing as it being evil, but it's just, it would be better if we just had a helper. Doesn't that also separate us a little bit more from monkeys, seeing that no other animal was able to fulfill us? Because yes. if we were just monkeys, maybe we would be fulfilled by other monkeys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I just want a dog, but no. Dog maybe. is a man's best friend. I do love our dog, <laughs> yes. but I love you much more. But what does it mean to be a helper then? The Hebrew word is... Etzer. Uh -huh. And it is such a beautiful it's a good word. word. <laughs> Guys, we've got to learn Hebrew. Because the word etzer, so many people are like, oh, it means helper. It means women have to help men. Women are below men. And that's not at all what it means. Which is not derogatory. 
it's not a derogatory word. It's a word that's, that Moses is, uses in his song to Israel to describe God the Father in heaven as our etzer, our helper, the one who completes us, the one who fulfills us, our better half, our other half, as I refer to you as my better half all the time. That's like me calling you an etzer in Hebrew. So you you know when you actually do a study on the word etzer, oh my goodness, it's so beautiful. It really holds the woman to you know just as high, if not a higher standard than the man because he, she completes the man. The man would not be complete without him. Yeah, man and woman, he created them. Like that's, That goes back to God, how he pronounced everything good when it all had uh, harmonious relations with each other. Like everything has its own counterpart and it all works together toward a mutual destiny of awesomeness as usual. And um, so in the, this is interesting that he gets to name the animals because in the first account of Genesis, um, God gives names to everything. He uses language to create everything. And then in the second account, he allows... Adam to uh, identify them and he recognizes the meaning in them. He's allowed to right. learn about them and um, have give feelings with names. Them. Yeah. So it's it's not like man doesn't get to impose meaning on reality that doesn't already exist. Right. right? It's there. He's he's just finding it like beautiful Easter eggs. And uh, you know, it, it's like when some somebody describes something to you and you repeat it back in your own words to show that you understand. Exactly. And I think this is uh, God's perfect way first example of, of that. Him growing in wisdom yes you know eventually we get to solomon who was the wisest man ever who like used the animals in the same way to like understand the world and this was god's creation he wanted to teach us personally everything about it he wanted to teach adam and eve step by step everything about it and adam and eve took a shortcut and said no we want to learn for ourselves we don't want to see what you have to offer we want to see everything the good and the bad and the ugly they want we want to see all of it right now we don't want to wait you give us a hand we want to take an arm and that's similarly to what happened yeah that was nice of god to let adam name all the animals very nice yeah uh, well, I, I guess it also kind of symbolizes his authority, too. His because, regents. Again, none of the animals got the opportunity to name us. Right. And um, essentially, like, that's that's another form of building a social relationship with God, too, because we, we decide um, this is what we're going to refer to and that's what it's going to mean. Whereas a rose by any other name would smell of sweet, you know what I mean? Like, it, whatever, if I name uh, uh, Chihuahua, Chihuahua, and, like, God doesn't... <laughs> you know, I, you know what I'm trying to say? Okay. Like, it's just a, it's a social thing that they have between each other and it's a building more of a relationship. So I'm forced to hold back what I, the, my last finishing sentence, which I'm so excited to say more than anything. So we have to finish chapter two, if that's okay with you. So we'll knock it out real quick. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You okay. wanted to say something real quick? It's fine. You sure? No, you're, you're more excited than I am. So I, I'm, I'm in. I like it. Okay. So we're just going to finish chapter two, verse 21 to 24, 25. Sorry. Bad. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Nice. Wow. My favorite part of chapter two. And so, yeah. what I want to expand on, what I'm jumping ahead a little bit, is so <laughs> many Bibles translate the Hebrew word rib and rib only. And that leaves out so much context, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Because not only is it the rib, it's the flesh, it's this, the whole side. It's the rib, the flesh, the skin, the blood. All of it. A little something from all of Adam's side. That it is truly him on him. It's not just one bone formed into everything. It yeah. was a piece of Adam. And it's so beautiful that the Hebrew word um, has the same play as in English. With man and woe man, you have ish and isha. So it's the same beautiful play on the word that the woman is just a, a following a more uh, completion of the man. And it's just, that's what I wanted to just throw out there. It's just uh, the meaning behind it. You know, it's not just the rib. It's the full side. The flesh, the skin, the bone, the blood. All of it. The life is in the blood. Really important. Yeah. And it's just beautiful to see that it's bone of bone, flesh of flesh, blood of blood, creature of creature, man of man. Totally. And you know, I've seen some kind of like angry feminist arguments that say like, oh, because a uh, woman was created after man, like she's already put in a lesser position than him. Uh, but I don't, I don't think that's substantiated. Not here at least because uh, in the future, we're going to have 
the son of man, Jesus Christ, come out of a woman, right? So, like, there's going to be this turnaround. And also, uh, when Jesus' side is pierced uh, at the time before the church becomes his bride is such an interesting symbolism if you think about, I was like, just going to say that, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, it's all, like, building up to a specific plan. And in the beginning, like, God created man and woman. Like, there's, they're both given this joint commission. And I truly believe the highest symbolic value of man and woman is Christ and the church. Mm-hmm. And I'm a Christian man. I'm supposed to lead like Jesus, and you are the bride, you are the church. And when we are both living a life towards God with the same goals, we could not have a better life. Our life is amazing and blessed in so many ways, better than it's ever been, because we're on the same team, we're on the same mission. We have become one flesh serving the same purpose. And there's nothing that could beat that. That is just so special. Yeah. And for anyone who's married, who's a Christian with not a Christian partner, God, pray. If your partner becomes Christian, I am telling you, the change of life that that yeah, you will have easier. is insane. It's it's beautiful. You guys will grow closer than you have ever have, even if you've been together a lifetime already. Yeah. I, I for one, know that I became less obnoxious. <laughs> yeah, me too. I became less of just a terrible, sinful person. Yeah. If less you're of myself. Both, if you're both working towards this mutual destiny of humility and harmony before God, then of course everything's right. going to be And we're both humble. There. We both realize that we are nothing without God. We're that, dust. Yes, because dust we, we shall we, return. Exactly. Without the breath of God, without the spirit of God, we are nothing. Yeah, and how are you going to argue that? Like, if Adam was made from dust and then the woman was made from man, which is already the image of God, like, don't, I don't, I don't even see the argument there that it's, it's, it doesn't need to be. It doesn't doesn't need to be. Look at, do a word study on the word etzer. You, yeah, it will open it, up so it. much. We should do a specific just reading of all the different definitions because, like, like it's words. described in so many ways. It's just so beautiful. It's so poetic, symbolic, everything. Yeah. Women is the completion of man. Nice. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so backtracking slightly, only a little bit. Uh, I, I know we watched a debate recently where Bart Ehrman, um, this was on uh, Unbelievable, really good. Um, great YouTube channel. Love great their channel. Show, love their podcast. Uh, but Bart Ehrman was like really insisting that these are two different stories, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And his reason for saying mm-hmm. that, that he was very um, firm in his thinking, is that it, it's a contradiction because in Genesis 1, the animals are made first. And in Genesis 2, it seems like the animals are made after and they're made for Adam because they're brought to Adam. And Adam has the opportunity to name them. And, um, you know, there was they kind of agreed to disagree because they just have totally different readings of the text. But I don't think it's a problem at all because uh, obviously if God is sovereign, then he had the intention of what he was going to do before he did it. Like the architect has the blueprint before he starts building the house. You said it. Amen. Yeah, that's how I feel. No, I agree completely with you. <laughs> Yeah, and um, I, and the creation story, you know, in Genesis one is is the all of it, and Genesis two is a more zoomed in view. Yeah, and I think they, they, I think they parallel each other beautifully. Yeah, I think that was like a, a kind of literary device for the ancient Israelites, anyway, to yes. do the coupling of stories like that, where right. you get two different perspectives, double sides. Um, yeah, I, I see no issue with that from that perspective. Uh, the last line, did you read yet, or did we finish the whole verse? And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. I had read it, okay. but I'll read it again happily. I thought there was a part where it says like, and therefore, that's... man shall leave his father and mother. Yeah, is that the next next one? Twenty four and twenty five. I'll oh. reread it. Oh, sorry. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The only the only thing that I saw that was kind of interesting uh, in commentary on that is that it sounds like it's from an oral tradition you know like it sounds like a father explaining to his son who was like daddy why do women and men get married and blah 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 like that's kind of how it comes off cross right there yeah it seems like it's stuck and hebrew started with all oral tradition Mm -hmm. beautifully yeah yeah for sure and it's it's amazing becoming one flesh as like a, a family unit and then multiplying is such a, a beautiful image of the trinity in the first place and that's like one way if you work harmoniously in love together as a unit and you do what god tells you to do then of course you're bearing the image successfully the Amen. way that god intended just like when we you know believe in the deity death and resurrection of christ we're granted the Holy Spirit, changes our lives. We want to be living for God. And therefore, we become part of, we don't become Christ. We become a representation for Christ. And it is the most beautiful, life-changing thing you could do, just like how you become one flesh with woman. Yes. Yeah. So I'd love to hear you guys' uh, thoughts on this, because I know we covered a lot. It's a, just one short chapter. Yeah, just one chapter at a time. You could dig so deep into it, and there's so many questions that arise along the way. Uh, so any any argumentation we really love welcome. when you guys ask us questions and make videos and send us lots of cool stuff so please continue to and we'll be here for it 
And thanks for your encouragement also. Yes. Your comments have been so wonderful, especially on our most recent two videos. They've been really, really beautiful. And uh, thank you all, everyone who said anything or participated in any way. And uh, we love you. We hope you find Christ if you have not already. That's what we're here for, to bring Christ to your life. And what's the beautiful little saying you always say? Oh, uh, well, well, the hammered lampstand is to illuminate the space between man and God. Boom. That's, that's, that's what I was looking for. That's, that's when I always forget, but that's beautiful. What the physical symbol is all about, isn't it? Amen. Charlie Brown. Amen and amen. So next time, we're going to be reading Genesis 3. So yes. guys. That's going to be, <laughs> that's going to be good. Yes, that is going to be, we're I'm, stepping into some, some muddy waters in Genesis yes, 3, yes. but it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Cool. We've got Let's Christ go to come along with us. So <laughs> amen. God bless you guys. Please share, like, subscribe, do whatever you can to help us grow. We love you. Send us questions. And uh, we'll see you very soon on the next episode of The Hammered Lampstand with David and Shelby. Praise be to God. My better half, my Etzer. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. <laughs>